everyone. Thank you for being here. Oh, okay, <laughs> thank you. Good morning for, for being here. Uh, I really appreciate you all coming out and listening to uh, my presentation this morning. Uh, Jasmine, did you want to do the uh, poll uh, before we get started or? Yes, I'll, I can go ahead and well, I'm going to uh, show a brief poll. There's only a few questions on it. I'd appreciate it if you could take uh, a minute to answer some of the questions. And this will help Bob know where we are regarding the topic today so that he can be better prepared to assist you and answer your questions. Okay, Yasmin, you want me to uh, go ahead and go through the Okay, poll? yeah. Do you want me to display the results for you? Yes, please. Would you? Yes. Okay. Tell, let me know when you can see them. Well, I can see them, so. Um, but... Okay, great. All right, everybody. I guess, uh, no, I don't guess. I, I see that we have 44% uh, of you all are been in business for two or more years. 26, two or less, 15, one or less. And uh, we got 15%, four of you have been out there about six months. How many employees do you have? 7% uh, over 10, somewhere between five and 10, 7%. Majority of you have one and two or uh, another 22% two and five. Uh, have you ever contacted the OSBU? Uh, the answer is yes for 26% of you and no for most of you, for 75%. So hopefully this uh, webinar will encourage you to reach out to your OSBU because they're a very valuable resource. Uh, do you use social media to communicate with your target audience? Yes, 37%, glad to see that, 66% said no. And when was the last time you updated your website to your target audience? Two years ago or more, 95%, five years, 4%, okay. So, um, thank you so much, uh, Yasmin, for that. Uh, I'm going to close the poll. You can close, close it on your end if it's not already closed. And I will uh, introduce myself again. Thank you uh, uh, um, for joining us. <clears throat> and Yasmin, thanks for that introduction. If you want a more complete rundown on who I am and what I've done, it's in the slide here before. Before you, I'm a practitioner of marketing and selling, as well as a student. And you can see uh, my credentials. The big thing I think you need to take away is that uh, I ran a government contracting business for 30 consecutive years and sold it. In other words, I started it ran it, sold it. So I've been through all the stages of entrepreneurship. And I like to think that uh, the things that you're struggling with or trying to deal with, I have probably have already done that or have done something similar to it. And then I wanna thank you for attending this online session. There are more events than time to participate uh, before the pandemic and after the pandemic, we were just del deluged. Uh, with requests to participate in daily webinars. You could have chosen any place to spend your time, but you chose it here, and I really appreciate it. Finally, I want to express my appreciation to Yasmin for uh, the opportunity to speak with you today. As you all know, if you deal with the Maryland Pre-Tax, she's the one to know. She determines whether you get on the schedule or not. 
During the course of this presentation, I will be making, uh, I'll stop periodically to answer your questions. Please put your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat. Uh, and uh, I think Yasmin is gonna help uh, facilitate that process of answering questions. Okay, so let's get into the agenda. So the, the first thing is, is understanding how an agency's OSBU can help a small GovCon. When I ran my government contracting business, I never talked to anybody in an agency before I talked to an, an OSBU representative. Um, it's kind of like looking at a menu before you go to a restaurant. Uh, it, it, it's much easier to understand what you want to do and, lays, and focus in on uh, a specific type of requirement if you already have a playbook in front of you. Secondly, we need to talk about your website. We need to talk about uh, early stage, many early stage and, uh, entrepreneurs figure, well, I figured out uh, Sam.cov and I put together a Wixit uh, uh, or a um, um, another type of uh, name, name escapes me, uh, website and so I'm done. I don't have to do anything more. That's all the federal government has required of me. And that's true. That is it. But if you think that that's all the, the, the feds look at, I think you're mistaken. And just nothing can be further from the truth. Before you set a meeting with an agency or an OSBU, the first thing they're gonna do is they're gonna look for, at your website. They're gonna look at your content, whether or not you, there's some social media posts. They'll probably go on LinkedIn. They're on LinkedIn. So it's an easy stretch for them to look for you on LinkedIn. So you, uh, need to make sure that you're cognizant of the fact that your presence on the web makes a difference. And then finally, you need to understand how to prepare a meeting for the OSBU. Since I was in the military and I founded a company that staffed military hospitals with healthcare workers around the globe, I gave dozens and dozens uh, of briefings to high-ranking military officers. In this last section, I will recommend to you the use of the webinar format to deliver your first presentation to an OSBU. There's some very specific reasons why I recommend that. Now, OSBU, of course, stands for Office of Small Disadvantage Utilization. This agency was created by Public Law uh, 95507 in 1979. The most recent circular from OMB, and OMB is the agency that interprets all the laws for all the agencies, was a memo written in December 2nd, uh, 2021, which spelled out the federal agencies will increase the share of government contracts, a targeted share of government contracts from 5%, which is what it is right now, to 15% by 2025. This executive director is an enormous opportunity to, for firms to work with OSBUs and to find chances to win contracts. I'll come back to this point uh, 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 later in the presentation. So what does an OSBU do? Well, the primary responsibility of an OSBU is to ensure the fair treatment of small disadvantaged, women-owned, service-disabled, veteran-owned, and hub-zoned small businesses. So they have an opportunity to compete and win a fair amount of the agency's contract dollars. Every OSBU has a director who provides guidance and advice to their agency program and, a, and uh, contracts officials on small business programs. So the OMB circular that I told you about, that goes to the director of the OSBU and all the other agencies in a federal government agency. The OSBU, however, has small business representatives who do, does most of the heavy lifting in the agency. Now, let me give you a caveat. When you come away from this presentation, please don't tell your friends, well, you know, I heard Bob Rogers give this presentation on the OSBUs, and what he said was, is that the directors don't do anything and the small business reps do everything. That's not exactly what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that you're more than likely to have your main point of contact be the small business specialist. They handle all the small business inquiries and requests for the agencies. They review solicitation requests to ensure all small business concerns are given an equitable and op uh, opportunity to compete. 
<coughs> excuse me, their reviews for pros contracts for possible breakout of items or services suitable for acquisition for small business concerns. And under the FAR regulations, they do more than advocate for small business participation and solicitations than I have time to go into. So they do a lot behind the scenes for you. And if you don't take advantage of what they're doing, then I think you have a tremendous missed opportunity. So the, the, the benefits are, are pretty straightforward of working with an OSBU. First of all, it's their main job to work with you. And they work for the agency to make sure that the agency complies with SBAs and, their, and, and therefore the Congress's mandate about how much business is going to be done with small business in those various categories. <clears throat> if, and, and Jaren, I'm sorry, are we still online? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Oh my and, gosh. And I see you. We just, just need said, you to share your screen again. Bob. Yeah, I, had a, I had a power surge. I apologize, guys. That's okay. Um, so while you're trying to reconfigure that, I'd just like to welcome everybody who's joined us since we started and to let you know that this is being recorded and that the slides will be sent to you after the presentation. If you have questions for Bob, which I'm sure you will do, just type them in the chat box and we'll get to them within the next hour. All right, can you see me? Well, I can see you, but we can't see your presentation. Okay, so I have to find what happened to the... Just go to, you should see the share screen button at, at the bottom at the bottom of the screen. Yeah, there we go, there we go, <clears throat> got it. Okay. We can see your desktop. There we go. Okay. We can see you again. Thank you. Can you see the presentation? No. Yes, we can. You can see the presentation. Yes. It says benefits of working with Osterboo. All right, great. Uh, I apologize, guys. This is uh, this is new. There's been a lot of new stuff here today, and uh, um, we'll just keep rolling with it. All right. So. Um, so the benefits, first of all, it's the main job, as I just mentioned, of the OSBU to work with you. Second of all, um, the SBA has targets for each agency to procure its products and services. And up to this point, it's been uh, 5%. And now, because of OMB Circular, it's up to 15%. Uh, the, uh, third, the OSBUs are a source of information to help you navigate the agency's procurement process. Suppose you have identified a possible product or service that you can provide for the agency. In that case, the small business representative can help you determine the resources and the capability that you're gonna need in order to satisfy that requirement. They can help you find teaming partners, potential subcontractors, and possibly uh, you know, the timing of when the bid solicitation is gonna come out. Those are huge, huge, huge advantages that uh, you could have. Fourth, most agencies have hundreds of program officers and dozens of contracting officers. If you follow the steps outlined in this presentation, you can get your OSBU small business representative to help you connect with the right people in your organization so they can save hundreds of man hours and much frustration on how to work with them, okay? Okay, so one of the things you have to understand is, is that there are differences between OSBUs. And, there, and over my 40-year government contracting career, I've talked to multiple OSBUs and each operates differently. They act differently because each agency has a different mission. I'll give you three examples. First of all, the Department of Energy has 17 labs and each of those has an OSBU. And almost all of the contracts come out of the labs, each with a special mission, for example, the Frederick National Library for Cancer Research in Frederick, Maryland is focused on cancer and infectious disease research. It has different mission completely than Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico, which is wholly focused on nuclear energy. If you have ever read anything about Los Alamos, you know that that's where we developed the atom bomb. Secondly, please talk to your small business representative in the Department of Health and Human Services in order to talk to them. You must fill out 
on their website. You must go to their website and fill out the outreach information request. And then according to the website, they say that they'll get back to you in seven days. And I've talked to the uh, uh, business specialist there and she confirms this, that you just don't dial up HHS. You gotta go through their, their uh, online uh, format. And then finally, this is probably intuitive to you, but the Office of Veterans Affairs prefers to do business with veterans. Suppose the VA awarded a contract to a non-veteran owned company. In that case, both the OSBU and the contracting officer would have to certify that no other veteran owned companies are qualified to do the work. That's a tall order. So you should probably think hard and long about doing business with Veterans Affairs unless you have a teaming partner that is a veteran or you yourself are a veteran. All right, I'm gonna stop here real quickly and see if there are any questions. Do I have any questions? Yeah, we do have one, Bob. Sure. Um, uh, this one is from Thomas, and he mm -hmm. asks, one of the most challenging obstacles during this time of year is finding the original statement of work for forecasted recompete opportunities. Do you have any suggestions on how to get the SO SOWs quicker than uh, an FOIA request. I guess that's freedom of information. Freedom of information, yeah. Freedom of information requests are gonna be forever. Um, uh, is Thomas, was it? Um, yeah. I, you know, I don't know about quicker, but what I do know is that I'm gonna show you later in this presentation um, that, OSBUs are required, agencies are required to forecast for an entire year what their procurement pipeline is going to be like. And I'm going to show you exactly where to find it. Now, after we pass that slide, if you still have a question, then ask me the same question again. Okay. Okay. That's all the questions for now. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So five keys to successful OSBU meeting. So this is the main part of the presentation. You have to understand the OSBU mission. You have to understand what the agency buys. You have to create content on your website that targets the agency. You have to maintain social media visibility. And then you have to prepare for a meeting with the OSBU. We're gonna go through each one of these. So understanding the OSBU mission is your first task. And every agency in the federal government has an OSBU. The mission of the OSBU is to help the agency meet their congressionally mandated small business procurement goals. Specifically, each agency has a socioeconomic goals to spread certain percentage of the contract awards to small businesses. The goals are two parts, prime contracts and subcontracting. So if, you know, this is one of the things that I think small businesses don't realize that agencies have subcontracting goals as well as prime, uh, prime goals. And all these are laid out in sba.gov on a scoreboard. And they track and monitor this. And it's public information. And all you have to do is go to sba.gov and then type in scoreboard into the search bar. And it will pull up all of the uh, uh, scorecards for every agency for every year since the act was first uh, in, uh, enacted. Now, here's the scorecard for the Department of State just to give you an idea. And you can see that their overall goal uh, was 23% for prime business and they exceeded it by going to 26. Subcontractor 29, they exceeded it by going to 30% and OSDBU compliance, which is a complex number, uh, is is very good. And then they have an overall score of 122 where the base score is actually 100. So the Department of State is one of the better states, uh, excuse me, better, better agencies uh, to do business with. Uh, I'm not going to go through and point out an agency that doesn't do this because I, I don't think that's fair. And I, I certainly don't want any repercussions coming back to me for figuring this out, but this is all pointing this out. This is all public information um, and, and, and you should look at it. And included in these are the, the uh, disadvantage goals. The state had 5% goal for disadvantage uh, business and they actually did 15 women owned businesses, had six versus five hub zone businesses. They had five actual versus three and services able veteran owned, they had four versus three. 
So you can see that this agency is doing it right and they're trying to, and they're, and they, and they're setting an example. They're one of the better agencies out there. So, but there's still some responsibility on your part, even though these guys are very proactive. And just because you're a certified business does not mean that your products and services are suitable for any specific agency, say the Department of State. Uh, moreover, Oswald's job is not to find you work. You must do the homework and then come prepared to talk about your company and how it can help a specific agency. Okay. However, the scope of the work, if the scope of the work is too large for you to perform, and this is one of the things that you'd find out once you reach the agency, it's too large or you may not be able to work with, uh, uh, you will be able to work with the OSBU to make sure that you can either have a teaming relationship or they can try to break the work down so that you can do it. This is all a part of trying to establish a relationship with and working with the OSBU as opposed to going directly to the agency. Now, how do you know what the agency buys? Well, the first thing is to go on the website. Look at, for let's say, for example, the Department of State. It's all about foreign services. They deal in global issues ranging from arms control, health, diplomacy, refugees. Naturally, most of their work is outside the U.S. So if you're not ready to do business outside the U.S. or have any of these kinds of capabilities, this is probably not a good match for you. The State Department has 46 bureaus purchasing almost any product or service, and this can almost be applied to almost every agency. Every agency has about 40, 50 uh, bureaus inside it. However, the best way to see how they plan to buy is to look at what they have uh, uh, bought in the past. And uh, you can review the agency's forecast uh, schedule for the coming year. And I'm going to show you in the next slide how to do that. So I have gone into uh, sam.gov and I've pulled down all the relevant websites that I think a small business would uh, want to know. Now, let me give you some upfront here. I'm not a business development guy. I'm a marketing guy. Business development guys, they live on these sites. They know how to manipulate stuff. They know pivot tables. They know how to pump out graphs. And although I consider myself a numbers guy, I don't spend a lot of time doing this. So you're going to either have to find somebody that does this or take a course. The PTACs have courses on how to who work these um, sites. So does the SBA. And the SBA has SCORE underneath them. And, and the SBDCs, they all have courses which can help you. But if not, if you want if you want to spend a little money, there are business development uh, uh, analysts out there that will help you data mine each one of these. The two that I want to point out to you are, first of all, let me get my little thing here, acquisition.gov. Now, if you go to acquisition.gov, and you don't have to go to the sbh.sam, you can go directly to it. You go into acquisition.gov, and then... Uh, peel down, it'll have every single solitary federal agency award, excuse me, forecast for the coming year. Now we're just transitioning from old, from last year to new, to the new year. And some of the agencies might not have everything up, but it, by the end of the month, they'll have their entire forecast there. It's legislatively mandated that they do that. And so that's a great way to figure out what's coming up way in advance so you don't have to uh, put in a FOIA or to try to figure out and read their mind. They pretty much, uh, they, they're not pretty much, they are required by law to put this out here. The other thing is that the system for award management has a continuous running tape where they show all the requirements and it's just a way for you to uh, see what's happening. And then if you're really ambitious and want to go back, uh, the Federal Procurement Database has uh, everything uh, that has ever been procured, and you just don't need to know how to data mine it, okay? All right, so uh, let me go now for that.
Okay, so are there any questions? Yes. Uh, back to Tom's question. I want to make sure I, I answered that. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Um, okay. So, well, Tom never got back to us, so I'm assuming that that, that answer that you provided was fine. So we have a question from Brian. What's the best way to get contracting officers to respond to you when you send an introduction letter and they don't respond? Okay, so uh, welcome to government contracting. That's going to happen to everyone. So one of the ways that I'm going to start talking to you about is how do you get someone's attention that's not that's not res responding to you? Um, uh, and a lot of this has to do with social media reaching out. Uh, on LinkedIn, there's an ability to um, uh, reach out to individuals and uh, directly. There's also a way to post, but an agency that does not respond to you is not acting uh, appropriately. That's a problem. That's something that you probably should be calling other people inside the agency, uh, maybe even writing an email to the OSBU director, find, finding out who the OSBU director is. But again, if you're if if I understood you correctly, you were talking about a contracting officer, and a and, and or and or a program manager. These people are deluged, deluged with requests from small businesses and large businesses, and they don't know who you are. And one of the suggestions that I'm telling you is going through an Osbu, where they will answer an Osbu's phone call, particularly since they know the OSBU is probably bringing them solutions to their problems as opposed to bringing them just a possible uh, answer. The OSBUs have already vetted you out, and so they're more than likely to listen to an OSBU than they are a, a cold solicitation from a small business. Okay, thanks. Let's go on to the next question. What is the scorecard used for and how will a small business use it to our advantage? Great question. Um, you, the, the, the way that the, the scorecard is useful because it shows by, if you, you have to go into it and look at it, but every single agency is broken out by prime and sub and also by disadvantage. So if you go into, for example, I'll just use this. This is one of my pet peeves, the Department of Veterans Affairs. The Department of Veteran Affairs has a goal of issuing 3%, not 5%, 3% of their work to women-owned businesses. Well, they've never hit that goal ever, ever, if you can imagine such a thing. So if you are a women-owned business, then you probably need, and you're a veteran, uh, the Veterans Affairs, believe me, is looking for women-owned businesses and they're trying to clear up that stain on their, on their sheet. The entire world knows that, that, that Veterans has a problem. You, you can use that. I wouldn't throw it in an Osbu's face, but I certainly would point out that you have done your homework and that you know that a certain agency is behind. Or you could flip it the other way and say, Hey, I know your agency does a lot of work with businesses like mine. And tell them, hey, you know, you think that you can satisfy the requirements after having looked at the requirements uh, on the acquisition.gov site that specifically point out what they're getting ready to buy for the coming year. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, so let's see. Are there any other questions here we haven't got to? Did you tackle Gary's question about disabled veteran businesses? No. Okay, what percentage of government contracts and grants are awarded to um, service disabled veteran businesses? Okay, no grants. Uh, grants, of course, uh, go to uh, nonprofits. But uh, service disabled veteran owned businesses, like all the others, have a 5% goal right now. And as I told you earlier, uh, OMB Circular 22-03, uh, which is sent out by the Director of the Office of Management Budget at the behest of, of uh, President Biden, is requiring all states, all agencies to gear up 
and increase those numbers to 15% by 2025. So this is a golden opportunity. It's three years to ramp up uh, from and triple the amount of work to businesses who are service disabled veteran owned. Okay, um, are you able, thanks for that, are you able to have a virtual address for your business to do business with the government? Are you able to have a virtual, oh, I see. Um, yes, uh, yes. Uh, I think um, to be on the safe side so that, uh, for, for example, my company is a virtual company, but it has a, uh, I have a a, um, a, a a site. It's a, it's, it's it's like rework. It's uh, where you uh, have desks, chairs, conference rooms, and they answer my mail. They uh, screen my phone calls and refer phone calls. My recommendation, and I have been saying this for decades to small businesses that they should not waste their money trying to rent space. They should use, particularly starting out, they should use these services first. And once they get themselves established, then they can move into, a, um, into an office space. To start out with a virtual one with your home address is not gonna work for the federal government. You need an office address uh, because you wanna keep, first of all, for two reasons. The Fed, I think the feds require that, but even if they don't, you don't want to have your personal business and your, and your, and your, um, your, 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 your business intermingled. You don't want to get the impression that you're just, uh, one, uh, 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 one set of resources feeds both. You want to give the impression that you're a standalone uh, entity that, in fact, is serious about doing business. Okay, that's all the questions for now. Thanks. Okay, great. Let's uh, keep going. How am I doing on time, Jasmine? I mean, you're good. You got another twenty five minutes. Okay, so uh, we've got three things to talk about: website, social media, and presentation. So, first of all, on the websites. Before you meet the OSDU, make sure that you that you take a good look at your website. When you contact the agency, your website may be the first introduction they see before meeting you. So, so I got a question earlier from someone who said that they sent an email in and um, uh, didn't get a response back. Well, um, maybe that individual, one of the possibilities, I'm not saying this is what happened. What I'm saying one of the possibilities is is that if your website, if you have no visibility in your website or your website doesn't answer their questions, doesn't look like it solves their problems, or if they go and look for you on LinkedIn or social media and you're not there, the first thing in their brain is going to be, well, this company is really not serious. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time with this company. I'll spend time with a company that has a website that speaks to solving the problems in my agency. And it looks like they've done their homework and they can help me, okay? Remember, government contractors are just like you and me. When they go to buy something, they research it first online and then they de either decide to order it online or they go in the store and they buy it. It's the same thing, same process. So make sure, so many of the GoCons make the mistake of treating their websites like a digital brochure. They fill it out once, and then they think, and, and and they think that that's it. Well, that's not it. Once you create it, <clears throat> you have to post new content to try to improve your visibility. You have to use the keywords that are important to the agency and what their site is. Where do you get the keywords? Well, you get the keywords from the research. You get the keywords from the research from reading the reading the website of the agency, and then looking at the new requirements that are coming out. That's where you get the keywords. In the next two sections, I'm gonna show you uh, the practical, the practices of creating high-performing websites, okay? All right, hang on here, guys, just one second.
Okay, am I back? Can you see me? Yes. Okay, I'm finding a sinus cold here, so bear with me. All right. So what you're going to need is a high-performing website. And what is a high-performing website? Well, it's a website, <coughs> excuse me, that people see that you are, you have value to offer and they're willing to engage with you, with you, meaning that they're willing to visit it, they're willing to look at the content, so forth and so on. So it has four components, clear messaging of professional imagery. You never get a second chance to make a good first impression. Ensure that you have your capability statement, NACE codes and other certifications are clear to the customer. Responsive design across multiple platforms. Ensure that your experience is optimal on all devices, especially mobile. Educational content, your expertise and capabilities solve the customer's problems. That's the issue I was telling you about before. And then the search engine optimization piece of it, where you want people who you don't know, but need your service products and service to find you on the internet through your keywords. That's what SEO is all about. We're going to talk about each of these in a little bit of detail because they're very important. <clears throat> Notice that 81% of buyers view your website before they make a purchase. And imagery has a lot to do with it. If your eyes have moved away from the text and they're looking at these parakeets, then I've accomplished my objective. I've made this thing to, to want you to look at those parakeets because the images are really important to supporting your message. They're just as important as the message, quite frankly. And you should use original photos if you can. But if you're going to use stock photos, make them of, of local scenes. Stay away from happy, smiling people. And for and my ardent plea to you is please do not use or try to stay away from using the bald eagle, the American flag. They're overused. Or some column of the federal building, some picture of Congress, the White House, you don't do business with Congress. You don't do business with the White House. Um, so you say, okay, Bob, give me an example. Well, I'll give you the, my example. My example was when I had a, <clears throat> a government contracting business and I staffed military hospitals, I didn't use any of those. However, I did use a picture of Walter Reed. Now, all of you in here have heard of Walter Reed. And more importantly, all of my target audience, which are military hospitals, know exactly what Walter Reed is. It is the most famous military hospital in history of the United States. So a picture of Walter Reed not only says that it's recognizable and visible, but it also says that it resonates with my target audience, who are healthcare workers. The next thing is you want to make sure that you have... Um, a, your brand positioning, which is pretty much your capability statement. And it should answer three questions. What is it you do? Who is your target market? And why should they buy from you? Okay? So make sure it's clear and straightforward. Don't try to be a jack of all trades when you talk about who you are. Nobody does everything. Uh, who do you do it for? You need to uh, tap your, your website with your certifications, your vehicles that you're on and your past customers. If you don't have any federal government work and you have state and local government work, that's just as good. If you don't have any state and local government work and you have private sector work, put that down there. But make sure that people understand that you have performance capability. And why should they contract with you? Show expertise through things like blogs. This is where you, uh, you get into white papers, testimonials, and by the way, guys, I'm on a big kick right now for video. Anybody who can create can create a video if you have a smartphone. You put that smartphone in front of you, put a little lighting, and you can create a video and upload it to any content you want, either a post, a blog, a website, or you can just send it as an attachment in an email. It's a great way to connect with your target audience. The responsive design means that your content is going to look good on any of these platforms. Tablet, laptop, uh, mobile phone, there's all kinds here. And without getting into all the technicalities, you need to make sure that when you look at, when you post something or you look at something on your website, 
make sure that you look at it on your iPhone or excuse me, on your smartphone so that you know that uh, pictures aren't cropped or uh, text is not um, uh, even or something is wrong, okay? Now, this is the most important part, which is, has to do with the content. You want to have educational content about your company. Your service pages, that means the services that you are, are provide, should be clear. Your capability statement should be there. Curiously enough, it's like downloadable information. So make sure that your capability statement is downloadable so they can pull it off on a piece of paper. Don't ask me why. It's just the surveys that I've read and information that I've done, uh, gotten over the years, uh, reinforces this. And then guides or white papers, if you have the time, are, are really uh, super ways to do it. Normally, to get uh, premium content, you don't have to, but you'll ask for a uh, first and last name and a email address. That way you can add them to your um, contacts list where you're continuously sending out the, the, the next type of information. The next type of information is called flow content. Flow content is blogs, videos, social media posts. These things don't require information back from the reader, but you want likes, you want shares, and you want uh, a lot of people to go on and look at your uh, information. Now, here's the key, guys. Don't try to sell. Don't say, you know, hey, look at me. I have all this capability. Uh, um, it's okay if you want a contract. If you want a contract, particularly a significant contract, or you formed a teaming relationship and, and got a contract and you want to talk about that and the requirements that you have and what you're doing for a client, that's fine. But to sit up and brag about what it is that you do um, is for, for a hard sales pitch is not the appropriate uh, use of social media. Now, search engine optimization is probably something that you may want to have a professional from the outside look at, but the basics are is that you want to have relevant keywords and look at here. These relevant keywords should match your SAM.cub profile and they should match your NACE codes. They should also match and I didn't put it in here, but they should also match the forecast for whatever agency you're going to go after. That's how you're going to get noticed. And your website should have links to a certain authority. For example, um, 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 federal government uh, agents, uh, federal, well, you could link them to the Osboos, but also uh, trade associations and organizations like that to to boost the authority of your website uh, we've already talked to you about user experience and, and optimization and then technology technology is coming out every year Ch google is changing every year you have to keep up and if you don't have an advisor to help you keep up you need to get one now here's an example of a company that uh, came to us they were uh, uh, a merger between two companies and uh, they wanted us to give a solid uh, in, uh, look. And so we put this caption, information technology, healthcare, and professional services. That's right there. That's what they do. This is a video. You click this and the video comes on board. And then these three tabs flip back around, but they say information technology, health and uh, health services, and professional services. And then Behind each one of these, if you click either this or you click the back of them, it'll take you to one of the service pages. So this page here is from the information technology, and this is network and information security. And then it goes through all the information that you need. And so it answers the question, what do you want to, uh, what do, you want to do? This is over here. And then who do you do it for? And then this section over here talks about all of the vehicles that they have and the past performance that they have and, 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 and the types of things that they do. And of course, the why somebody should do it for you is in this panel right here. Okay, so there's a live um, explanation. I'm going to plow through the social media 
uh, to make, just to make sure we get through it, and then I'll take questions. So, one of the most frequent questions I get asked all the time, and it's very difficult sometimes to get government contractors to buy into this, is why do I need social media? Look, the government already I already fill out Sam. Okay, I already, already fill out the Sam, and I got a I got a website. Now you're coming to me and you're telling me I got to spend time on social media. I have proposals to write. I've got uh, meetings to go to. I've got too many things to do. I don't want to write <clears throat> any social media posts. Fair enough. I get it. You're pressed for time. Okay. I was pressed for time when I ran my company. My company had 200 people in it. I had 400 problems a day, but I made sure that I had a robust marketing Act activity and it included social media as well as updating my website not to mention face-to-face -face, uh, 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 opportunities to meet with clients it takes it all it, all of these things come in and come in handy so if you if you're not on social media you're missing out you really are missing out and you should take a, a, another look at what i'm going to say to you today now, if you're in the B2G space, which I assume most of you are, look up here what it says. It says that the platform most used in B2G and B2B is LinkedIn, followed by Twitter. Facebook is second, but I predict that YouTube is going to overtake Facebook. That's why you're seeing Facebook with Facebook Live, and you're seeing other uh, stuff like that to ward off the advance of YouTube, which is the fastest growing social media platform out there. What do you use it for? Well, you use all these things to network, to promote your content as a thought leader and an expert, uh, to SEO. This is actually how you can change your website content through blogs and use the keywords to increase your SEO and recruiting. If you guys or haven't already experienced, it's tough to recruit people. And people, the biggest factor people want to know about you is they want to know if you're a winner. Do you win contracts? Are you growing? And so reassuring them that you that you that you do grow and that you can grow is what you should be talking about in your content. So LinkedIn, just a quick summary here of the things that you need to know. Concentrate on this last page, last part here about having a great professional photo, a tremendous descriptive title. Uh, make sure that this LinkedIn links back to your website. Twitter is used by everybody. If one of you wants to take out your phone and tweet a, a happy thought about this uh, 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 webinar, I would be happy to see that on my Twitter feed. Uh, it's only 280 characters, and quite frankly, um, because of Twitter, I only, all my posts are under 280 characters uh, across the board and all my platforms. Uh, the YouTube videos are just indispensable. I have a number of them. If you go on my website, they're all there. So the website has the video link to YouTube. So if you go to my website and you click on it, and you think you're looking at stuff and on my website. No, you're not. You're looking at my YouTube channel. And I give all the information there. So there's all kinds of information on YouTube. And especially I want to point out that if you want a tutorial on SAM.gov, FPDS, or anything else, there are many people like me who are more than willing to post their information for free on a YouTube video. I, I use this stuff all the time all the time all right here is my one another client another government contractor that uh, uh she her business is very dynamic growing very rapidly and she decided early on that she wanted to be on all three platforms linkedin twitter and facebook and this is just examples of her plan she's in the uh healthcare research space and uh, uh, you can see she's got 2,000 followers. Uh, when she came to us, she had you know, something like 500. Uh, she has uh, 2,000 people. She has, excuse me, she has, a, she has a, a, um, 
she has 500 pe she has 500 people that hit her website every every uh, month that's an enormous number um and then here's a twitter post notice this little thing here this bitly this links back to uh the website we're trying to drive traffic to the website because we want our website to be to, uh, to be uh, a, a high performing website right that's how you get to be high performing same thing with the facebook okay so i'm going to stop here before i get to the last part about how to prepare for an ospu and then when we finish questions tell me how much time i have because i don't want to go over please okay yeah you're good to go um we only have a few minutes left, but you, we don't have any new questions since you last answered. So, yeah, you can carry on. Excellent. Okay, so how do you prepare for a meeting with an OSBU? The email actually is the best way to reach out to an OSBU, but you really should do a lot more than that. And when you get there, you need to make sure <clears throat> that uh, you do a Zoom presentation. Why am I recommending? This is Bob recommending. My point is, it doesn't really matter how you get in front of an OSBU, you should, get in, you should use a method that's most appropriate. But a PowerPoint Zoom presentation is easy. First of all, you got to remember, the feds are not always there. A lot of times they're at home. Uh, second of all, you want to make a great first impression. So you want to make sure that you give them everything you need and you want to control the environment. OK, so that they're seeing the best of what you have to see. And you don't want to oversell. And I'm going to go through each part of this. So why you want to educate your audience, you want to establish expertise and you want to secure the next meeting. The purpose of the first meeting with the OSBU is to get a second meeting. Let me say it again so everybody doesn't, doesn't forget this. The purpose of the first meeting with the OSBU is to get the next meeting. That's all. That should be always your 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 purpose when you are trying to sell to anyone. So, interestingly enough, people don't take enough time to think about who should make the presentation. The assumption is is that if the CEO, the owner of the company, or whatever should be making the presentation. The fact of the matter is is that maybe not. There could be somebody who you know who already knows some of these people inside the agency and has inside information. Also, you may have a thought leader, a subject matter expert, someone else who would have, be better at explaining this. In that case, the CEO should step back, step aside, and let that individual give the presentation, okay? Because they're probably more likely to remember you and they now know that you have some great capability on your, on your staff. So when you create the meeting outline, think systematically about your topic, organize your presentation, and make sure you go over and over and over to cover any gaps in your storyline. So a mission statement is a great way to, to start off, okay? Because it, it sets the tone for who you are and what you're all about. And that mission statement should probably complement why it is that an agency should work with you. Uh, I just listed uh, some capabilities down here, uh, past performance, testimonial, case studies, content on website, website on LinkedIn, specific opportunities. These are all ideas, but the point is, is that you need to make sure that you're very clear and very succinct about what you're doing. Developing a presentation. Uh, make sure you use uh, PowerPoint or Keynote. Uh, these are wonderful tools, which are, I, I, I swear by PowerPoint, I use it all the time. You should have a cover slide that gives the title, the presenter, the date, and related imagery. Imagery, again, is very important. Uh, a facilitator, I'm very lucky to have Yasmin who's facilitating it's very hard for me to read the chat, move the slides, uh, and do the polling and all the rest of that. You need somebody else there with you. And also, uh, <clears throat> I, I normally just talk about technical malfunctions 
uh, and the possibility that something happens. Today, you saw it won't happen. It, it just, uh, you know, in all the presentations I've given, that hasn't happened. But it, it doesn't matter. Um, whatever, Jasmine and I were talking about this before I started. Whatever could happen does happen in a presentation. And you should be, you should be prepared for it. You should be cool, calm under the circumstances and try to re recover. Uh, no more than four uh, uh, points on a slide is a general rule. Uh, and then make sure the concluding slide has questions. And then now it's showtime. Now you're ready to go on. Uh, we've talked about the facilitator. Make sure you're on 30 minutes before. Make sure that <clears throat> if you have the capability to have closed captions, that's fine. Uh, eliminate background noise. Don't have dogs barking or anybody interrupt you. I was literally on a, a industry presentation where the presenter who I had never seen before was in front of a large audience like this one and his cat walked across the top of his computer. Undaunted, this gentleman reached out and petted his cat. I I'm not making this stuff up, guys. He pets his cat. I can't imagine a more distracting thing. Don't get me wrong. I don't have any trouble with pet, pets, cats, or anything else. But I probably would wait until after the presentation or before the presentation to make sure that my cat didn't jump up on my, on my desk. Now, all of us have experienced the fact that in a meeting <clears throat> with colleagues, they get interrupted. Cats, dogs, uh, spouses, kids. That's one thing. But for a presentation, for an Osbu, where you're trying to make a good first impression, please keep these distractions to the, the, the minimum as much as possible. Okay. And then follow up. Uh, you're, uh, I forgot to mention earlier that one of the things you should do is to ask the Osbu if you can record the meeting. Ask permission. Don't just assume because it can be extremely helpful when you follow up and send them a copy. It also, when you, if you get that second and third meeting, you can also refer back to that meeting to figure out exactly what it is that each of you said so that you can have a, a trail. Making sure that you follow, putting the individuals on your, on your uh, contacts list and following them up with either uh, social media or blogs, whatever, whether or not the meeting they, leads to a second meeting or not, they should now become a part of your constant uh, information feed. So I've concluded my remarks. I want to make sure that you understand from a summary point of view, we've come uh, uh, to uh, four uh, key points, understand how an Osbu can help a small GovCon, creating your content on your website that, that targets the agency's needs, maintain social uh, uh, media visibility, and prepare for an Osbu meeting. And my recommendation is that you do it uh, 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 through a webinar. On the other, uh, through a uh, uh, social, uh, through a, uh, yeah, through a webinar. But if you decide that you want to do it face-to-face, -face, and that's the way you roll, that's the way you feel comfortable, it doesn't matter. Just make sure you get the meeting. Okay, that's it for me, J Jasmine, before I close out. Uh, can I answer any questions? Hi, thank you so much, Bob. That was great, uh, very informative. And as I said, I've been recording this session, so the replay will be available this afternoon on our YouTube channel. And I will be sending you the slides as soon as Bob sends them over to me. Um, so yeah, I'd like to thank Bob for the presentation and I'd like to thank everybody for participating today. And just to remind you that your PTAC counselor is always available to assist you with any of your government contracting goals and questions. So please do reach out to them. Okay, so thanks again, Bob. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Bye guys.